How's it going, internets? I hope you're having a lovely day. It's that time again. It's time to get into some animation. It's time to get uh, that imagination all revved out. It's time to get into some creativity, and it's time to get inspired. And today's inspiration comes from Tom Laval. And if you're not familiar with his work, check right over here. Uh, he is probably a contemporary or in that same uh, vein. He worked with Colliers and Cosmopolitan and uh, all of the big illustration uh, periodicals of the day. But he, he was uh, originally kind of trained uh, as a battlefield illustrator, uh, which is a, a unique take on it. But his, his work is definitely uh, a contemporary of the time of uh, Rockwell or Grimace or um, any of that uh, kind of uh, probably second wave of 1900s illustrators. Uh, his, his stuff's beautiful, great coloring. I really like that um, I use kind of a, a black and white base for a lot of his paintings with um, like especially on this one you can see it's very uh, very muted but then with these really popping reds and kind of these nice blues and everything like going here as well that uh, help keep it kind of having that uh, vintage style of like a sepia sepia tone not not exactly, but but still keeping. I, I tend to find myself more drawn towards muted um, colors and really. Um, honestly, I like sketch work the most. But if I'm gonna do color, I usually only do it very very um, minimally, and so I, I really find that uh, great in his work. And, and you can see it's with a piece like this, you keep almost everything uh, very low tonality, and bam, the hair on this chick and the purple color just really pops out and again strong anatomy um, great expressions on the faces and everything too uh, some more beautiful work of his I really like the hand on this one I thought that was really well done also the lighting the way the hands the lighting setup is really really nice as well you know you can see the um, the light source would be coming from like the top left and you can see that going through here and it's just a really well done lighting as well I liked on that one set a good mood and setting for that one uh, this one could, could be a, uh, a Rockwell <laughs> it's like like I said he, he's definitely a contemporary I think there's um, there's strengths uh, and, and some you know variations uh, between his stuff but but you can see that definitely it, uh, it captures the spirit of that style at least popular um, this is some he also did some stuff I believe for National Geographic where um, he did more historical illustrative and uh, painting work and you can see there's just so much detail in here with all the different boatsmen and their kids playing and just tons of great stuff and, and this would I imagine would have been very difficult trying to keep a pattern in through a tapestry while getting the folds down and having all the weight feel there and then getting the perspective on top of that I imagine this part in particular at least for myself maybe you guys are really good at that but I imagine that would be um, something that, that would take quite a while to do. I've never really um, attempted to draw or illustrate a bunch of uh, fabric on top of each other. Um, that's a, it's a good challenge for you guys if you're ever looking and you feel like you're, you're uh, if you're an illustrator or somebody who, do, who does a lot of visual stuff, if you feel like you're kind of hitting a plateau, um, one thing that's really interesting to do is try and do different textures and different weights um, so like draw a bunch of different steel bars and gold bars and how they would land on top of each other if you dropped them versus how would um, you know fabric lay on top of each other definitely uh, just another one of those it, it's, it would be different than a uh, still life um, type of drawing because you'd be looking more at um, the weight and the way that uh, things would would lay out over each other versus just in, you know a vase and an orange or whatever it is here in these normal still lifes. Uh, and this again, just great anatomy, great layout, really nice composition. I like that he has kind of a really uh, neutral uh, kind of a background with only really this tree and a little bit of the mountain ranges that, that adds variation and the rest of it's pretty neutral. And then you get a lot of these action shots right here in the middle to really bring the viewer's eyes. And the other thing that he kind of does that's interesting, I think, is um, if you look at kind of the the composition, the layout here, you've got this sphere that leads the eye, which leads to that sphere that leads the eye, which brings it right over here. And you've got these uh, great 
posing in here and nice silhouettes through everything and then again um, the angle of the shields and these spears and this one they all keep the eye pointed towards you know the main focal point and even this one here too if we were to draw lines on all this stuff you'd see it really just trying to get everything pointing towards this action shot right here and that's uh definitely a lot of thought went into that it's not just willy-nilly placing spears you know and, and even the way the arrows are going and these guys in the back and you know, all that stuff's really uh, really a lot of thought in here uh, and again we can go through and i can stare at these oh this one i like as well another example of kind of that that muted tones where you've just really got probably i mean granted there's a lot but the majority of the colors is just you know you black and white with uh, different hues of kind of a burnt orange kind of a color there and i really like it when you can keep your color palette to almost three or four uh, colors uh, and then just do kind of the different hues working within those um but i want to share a quote with you guys because i'm rambling i'm just evidently really uh, encaptured uh, by his work today um i'm going to share a quote with you guys that's at least attributed to him uh and he said i consider myself a storyteller with a brush I try to place myself back in imagined situations that would make interesting and appealing pictures. I am intent on producing paintings that relate to the human experience. And I thought that was, there's a couple um, great little little morsels in that. Uh, the first one being the, the storyteller with a brush. And that's something that we, we talk a lot about, um, especially with animation. And I think uh, is really um, prevalent in illustration as well. And that's... Uh, you know, finding that storytelling pose that, that you can look at and the viewer can just look at it and go, you know what, I know, or you have a good idea of what happened right before that and you have a good idea of what's going to happen right after that. Like, you know, this one, there must have been some sort of um, bomb that went off over here where there was an explosion and this guy's hiding from these troops and he's just uh, tried to, you know, he's probably on his knees before, like begging them not to come this way. And the next one, you know, they're going to be off screen or, you know, further down. And this guy will have been trampled, and this guy might be, you know, booking it for the uh, hills back here if they didn't catch him already. But there's just that thing where you're, you're telling a story with a single image. And, and it kind of goes to that famous, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. But I think it goes to, you know, there's a lot of things. Um, there's a something I was reading yesterday, which I apologize, I can't remember the exact um, quote, but it was... um. I, th I think it was when I was doing research on, on, on Tom Lavelle, and uh, he said, you know, uh, with, uh, with a writer, you can get away with kind of setting the mood for one character and giving a few little describing bits about him and then go on with your story. With an illustrator or a visual artist, you have to know uh, the time of day it is, you have to know where the sun is in there, you have to know the kind of architecture that you'd have in the background of that layout, you have to know the, the clothing styles you'd have to know you know what kind of weaponry would work at that time you'd have to know how the relationship between uh you know men and women was during that historical period or that you know there's just so many other things that um and again this isn't to put down um, writers at all but but with a visual uh, narrative or an illustration or something there's just so much stuff to think over and especially if you get into more intricate and detailed stuff you know, with you know ornate backgrounds or any of that stuff of the, the artists that I know I'm, I'm drawn to you really have to have such a vast knowledge of things to pull from all the time in order to, to put that uh, stuff in your work and again in this um, sort of internet age uh, it's a little bit easier because you can kind of do quick research on the fly but even something just even 10 or 11 years ago would be something we'd have to you know check out 10 different books from the library and try and put all this stuff before so th we're really lucky and fortunate in that you know you can do a quick google search of uh you know uh what was the attire and architectural structure of you know life in the 1690s and you can i'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that uh, you pull up just right away nice so we're a little spoiled that way but anyways i'm rambling let's go ahead and get into some animation this is the sergio rig it's a free rig you can grab over at creative crash and if you're not familiar with what we'll be doing for the rest of the video is we give ourselves 48 frames it's two seconds of animation and i go off and i find a rig that i've never used before it's a free resource for you guys to play around with and we kind of go from there uh, we've been doing uh, jump vember for uh, the month of november but i think for december we're kind of just going to leave it open um, and then 
maybe in January we'll have more of a themed month and kind of play off every other month that way. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, get in here. Let's go ahead and make sure we have just our nerve curves, nerve services, and polygons selected. Let's go ahead and save our file. We are using Autodesk Maya 2014. For more information on Tom Lobel, a link to the Sergio rig, and uh, more stuff about uh, Autodesk and Maya, check the description below, as always. And uh, let's go ahead and create our first pose here. Like I said, I've never used these this rig before, so I'm a little bit of uh, kind of researching going into here. Okay, so let's let me do it on this. Just gonna pause this one second. Okay, let's resume that. I think I got it working in there. So I gotta go over here and select this control here and turn on IK to zero and then uh, FK to one. And then make sure we go in here and run this set to one and that attribute as well. And that should allow us to do it. And I usually like to keep my um, arms and FK and my feet in IK so you can keep the feet actually planted to where we want them to be. Arms can kind of move based off the movement of the body here. So let's go ahead and turn on that here. Make sure we're using the right controllers. And we'll pick this guy. Make sure he puffs out his chest a little bit. I think he seems like somebody would have a puffed out chest to me. Hey, it's me, Sergio. get into a uh, kind of character it would it would actually have here. Doesn't seem like the Maya controller actually does much here. a little bit of kind of a Fred Flintstone middle section. If you're not familiar with the Flintstones, man, go watch the Flintstones. Gotta love the Flintstones, man. Okay, let's go and grab this guy. kind of give your feet a little bit of personality there and don't keep them too flat and straight on the camera. Always want to try and do a little bit of tweaking to uh, every single controller just to make sure you're getting the control right. still get some personality but uh, more so than a kind of a, a theme to a, just uh, do something that would be you know his typical walk cycle if it was uh, you know a movie or a game they would 
kind of default uh, personality that you have rather than something where it's, you know, oh, we want to show off that this is his um, angry acting scene where you could definitely go in and, uh, you know, do something different than the, the regular. This would be more just like a personality walk for setting up, like, what kind of a personality would this guy have in his normal and each and every day Let's go ahead and uh, I'll just save our file as we're working. And uh, take a little while for some reason. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of um, bend here and relax on these fingers. Just get more of a relaxed starting pose there. are always interesting um, whenever I play around with a, a rig that I've never used before which uh, lately has been every day I'm always uh, interested to see the approach on how the um, rigging artists uh, set up the thumbs I always find that um, there's never really a consistency with thumb rigs um, they always kind of you can tell that each and every person puts their own uh, personality into how they approach doing a thumb and I always find that interesting. Um, after using, uh, you know, a different rig every day for, oh, what have we been doing this for? Last, at least six months, I think. Maybe a little bit longer. You have to let me know. Some of you guys have been subscribed the whole time, which you're awesome, by the way. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Uh, maybe not. We'll see. Um, but I always find that interesting. And I kind of always look forward to, okay, how's this guy going to approach the thumb? Versus, you know, I still think my default favorite go-to rig, which I, I'm sure there's free versions out there, but I think normally you have to uh, uh, get it with um, How to Cheat in Maya, which is a phenomenal book. I don't know if I linked to that book enough. I should do that down below. Uh, but uh, the Goon Rig that they include is probably my favorite kind of basic rig to use when I do a shot. It's just very lightweight and uh, very pliable. Um, so definitely check out that rig. That's probably my number number one uh, recommended rig for anyone who's starting to learn animation. I've spent countless hours using that rig. Okay, so I think we'll start with uh, kind of a default pose like this. And I'll go ahead and save our file and make sure that we just have our Nerve curves, nerve surfaces, and polygons selected, and we'll go ahead and set our frame range from 0 to uh, 48. Let's go ahead and uh, create a polygon parameters cube here, so we have a ground base to go off of. I always like to at least do a, uh, a floor, just so, uh, I don't know, helps, helps me visualize it a little better than if I just do everything um, in floating in air. It always seems distracting to me to not have that. So I think I just want to grab everything in there. Five. And I set our first cube at zero. Now it looks like there's already some stuff locked in here. So let's go ahead and uh, that graphic are open here. For some reason they've got a bunch of stuff. do whatever we want with it. We're not going to you know, count on animating whatever was already previously there. Okay. So I, mean, I think we'll do a cycle for this one. Just in the mood to kind of do cycles on bases. And let's go ahead and move that back there. And move that forward there. Kind of see if we get that variation. Make sure that spacing feels fairly even. I think we could probably push this one forward a little bit more. 
she's still in it, made it feel like there's a good balance of loop here. So we've got um, a lot of stuff going on in uh, the chest, a lot of weight here. So I kind of have the hips pulled back a little bit further just to kind of counterbalance that a little bit more. Um, and uh, always, uh, if you guys ever go, you know what, to me that doesn't look like that weight is on or, you know, you have a different uh, view, please feel free to comment down below. Because anytime um, you're looking, it's really something that I don't think is um, done enough for people who are uh, visual artists. And I know for myself, it's something that I kind of struggled with for a while and still do. It's one of those things that I, I don't like doing, but um, I think it's important to do. And that's to write out what you don't like about something or what you do like about it. If you can put it into words, it's gonna help you um, better understand and rationalize your thought for like, you know, this guy's work I'm a big fan of. Okay, that's great. Why? What is it that you like about his work? If you can speak to it and say, you know, I really like their approach to how they animate um, hands or they do the, the really, um, fire hose style um, arms like uh, in the, a lot of the old um, uh, Disney um, you know silly symphony style animation or uh, now Adventure Time kind of does a, a similar thing with how they do um, those kind of noodly arms um, you know just figure out what it is why you like something or why you don't and that'll help you um, so, so that's what my main point is uh, to say like if you guys notice something in my animation that um, you know you just disagree with or you don't like, that's good. It's good. It's great. I'm I'm happy if that's something that you're doing because it means you're putting thought into it and you're thinking about what you like about it or what you don't like about it. So I always um, you know welcome criticism because at bare minimum it's going to get you thinking about it, and uh, chances are if you're I'm pretty good about replying to any comments or messages that I get. Um, it'll get me thinking about it and go, you know what, maybe that guy's right. Maybe that would have been a better approach to it. Um, so it's it's always good to get that kind of dialogue going, even if even if you don't end up sharing it, you can at least think about it. I, I find that being forced to type it out or to write it down on paper um, forces you to think a little bit more than just a passing thought. So I definitely challenge you guys to do that. That's one of the reasons why um, when I post these videos, I also post just a snippet of the animation itself. Um, for it's, it's also just good practice for myself to, to, to type out um, like what it is that's actually happening. Um, it, it makes me think about my animation in, in terms of verbalizing it, which helps you become a better communicator. So if you're working at a studio and someone um, said something to you, you know, you'll probably have a better vocabulary for understanding what it is, or at least you can verbalize, you know, your reasoning behind it or why that's, you know, this way or why it isn't versus going, oh, I don't, I'm, no one's ever really questioned me or asked me about why I do it that way or why I didn't. So it's a good thing to, to think about as well. So I just add, add a little weight in these uh, steps here. Rotating these two uh, favor the planted foot here. So you can see that we uh, kind of over exaggerated it on one side versus the other. So let's make sure we get a little hand in there. I don't know if it worked too much about that last one because I'm just going to copy that first frame up there. And that's middle mouse button and hit S on your keyboard if you didn't know how to uh, copy that, which I'm sure you guys all do. So you're all super smart and awesome and amazingly talented and creative people. You are. Don't doubt yourself.
twist in each step as well. Just uh, pull them back just a little bit more than what we've got. It's probably pretty close to how much offset that I want. Let's see here. Yeah, let's go ahead and bring up like a fog here and see if we can do a little bit. exaggerate the middle portion a little bit more than, um, than the bottom section. So let's see if we can exaggerate that and then we'll tone down uh, the base here. Let's see how that goes. Again, let's go ahead and take this guy and we'll just tone down the amount of movement that we have there. We'll still leave a little bit, but I feel like the, uh, the bottom just feels a little too much. Yeah, let's squash it down even a little bit more. And one thing we're going to have to think about, and again, this is our uh, we kind of try to give ourselves about an hour to do this so you got to be aware of the knee pops that's why in most of the walks i do i usually drop the hips a little bit lower than is completely natural just because it gives a little more cushion in there and we don't have to do a whole uh, going through and doing the knees on ones and twos where in probably uh, more um, full-fledged walk cycle you'd probably be, get some more actual streets in each step but it depends too. I mean, it's it's a stylistic thing as well. Um, but it's probably not super accurate. It'd be more accurate to get that straight leg and then plant and bend it. But we'll work with what we got in the time frame that we're given each and every day. Try and try some new stuff out. Push our creativity and our skill and the craftsmanship that we. some reason that's a little bit of a lock. 
two performers in a little bit more. Feels like this arm's a little more loose than that one. And again, we're gonna go into the elbows and the hands and stuff too. For some reason, I'm usually about halfway into doing uh, a video with you guys. I usually start to get the hiccups. Kind of a weird thing. If any of you are doctors out there who are psychologists or whatever, let me know what you think about this. Forearm up a little bit more, drag it back there. Hold the hand, drag it back there. Almost there. And if you were wondering um, what I was talking about here, is that for some reason this frame here locks off. See that? It's like almost a um, stepped curve for some reason. So I'm just going to key this one. For some reason, on this side, I tend not to swing things forward enough. So let's go ahead and uh, push that forward a little bit more. to help loosen up the shoulder kind of area and add some variation there. And again, I'll probably end up toning this down more. It's always important to watch your animation, not just sit in front of the graphic or at the game or anything, but just see how it's playing out there. Okay, again, 
let's crank that up. So. What if we even put that at six? Where's the tail at six? exaggerating right now so I might go back and do that I wish that I, I don't think the net controller was actually working though which is one reason why I think this might not work as much as I want it to yes yeah, the net controller just doesn't really do anything for some reason so I think just too much in the head and since I don't have a neck to really counter it all balance it. Just, I want to get some movement in the head, but I don't want it to feel too much like it's too spacey or that the head's too bobbly. a little bit of variation in our timing a little more here. So we exaggerated for a little bit more and now let's um, actually first let's even out or rotate Z a little bit more. And things don't have to be exactly even. The goal isn't to uh, make it look robotic where it feels like every frame is a mimic of the other frame but just so that we're not really having one side be favored um, for no reason you know like i said if they have a bum leg or um, you know they just stub their toe or they, we have like a storytelling reason for doing that that's one thing but if we're doing it just because okay you know a little bit of variation in our timing there now let's go ahead and look at the uh So we do that. 
always like to do um, a little bit of toe in there just to break up the foot silhouette a little bit more and the timing. And by doing uh, a little bit in the heel and a little bit in the toe, you can keep the foot more alive for any place where it's moving. seam as we transition from the end to back to the beginning there. Okay, and let's go ahead and grab this one. Now we're going to drag the toe down a little bit here, we'll lift the foot up between the two frames and plant it down, just so we have the contact and then a little bit flat. And this way, so we'll sell it, there's a little more drag lifting up and the heel contacts and lift the toe up two frames later and it's a full plant down on the ground okay now let's go ahead and grab both of the feet here and we'll take a look at the rotate axes and we'll even that out a little bit more Doesn't have to be like that, doesn't have to be exactly even, but just so there's a more of a uniformity to the way that he steps. And let's go ahead and look at the um, toe as well. Here to think whether it was the toe roll or the toe itself. Okay, it's fairly consistent. One thing I'm going to do now that I'm looking at this a little more is take the um, translate X, which is the side to side movement of the hips, and tone that down a little more. It feels like he's um, a little too swayed in the hips, which is okay, but I think I want to just tone it down a little bit more. Feels a little more natural. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at the hips here. We got a little bit of sway in there. I'm going to break that movement up a little bit more. And let's go ahead and grab. Tip the mid and the root here on each of these fingers, and we're going to set that a little bit forward, and swing it forward a little bit. And we'll swing it back, and swing it forward, and go back to where we were again. Now on this forward. a little too over the top here. So let's do something that feels a little more natural. And now let's take um, all the mids and tips on all of them here. So that way you have the root of the finger leading the mid following and then the tip of it following after that. And then another thing to break up the timing here, let's take the index finger and let's uh, push all that stuff forward a frame. And the pinky finger, and we'll have it drag back a frame. And that way you can see just our timing a little more. Well, I can drag 
still think that perhaps um, at least the tips and the mids on the forward swing just feel a little too loose. I guess I'm just that kind of opposing. It's okay, but I think it should probably be a little bit further or more straight. Because I do like um, kind of breaking things to loosen stuff up, but sometimes it just feels too you either have to swing really caricaturized or uh, really loosely. Like, or just a little bit, really. Because uh, if you do this weird kind of middle ground of kind of non committal to going over the top with your animation or, uh, you know, not enough, it just doesn't feel right. So you either want to kind of go one of two ways. I usually default probably more on uh, under exaggerating for myself than over exaggerated, but it depends on depends on the shot and Excessive movement throughout. And then let's take everything that's on the index finger here and push it forward a frame. And everything that's on the pinky, let's delay a frame. So that way we've got uh, a two frame difference throughout the fingers here with the movement. And we do have to spice it up a little bit more with some tweak the preview. Some silhouettes where you see like like this where you'd be able to see a little sliver of spacing in there. Like that. And that just loosens it up a little bit more. I'm just kind of favoring it one side versus the other. Now another thing you can do is kind of amp up um, the grouping. I'm not using every single thumb controller, but I don't really feel like it's super necessary. As long as we're getting some movement on there and not locking off, I think we're fine. I am approaching, you know, this thumb a little bit different than the other side, but the idea behind it is the same. I didn't want to really stick with the same exact timing.
looseness in the jaw here as well. too over the top but uh, as I say often always uh, easier to to uh, over exaggerate and pull back than to uh, continue to just inch forward and forward and forward so let's just take everything we have here and just tone it down quite a bit because I, I don't know that we need a ton of this but just so we can add some more looseness to the face helps uh, Add some character and uh, create help better create that illusion of light. Kind of writing that he's muttering to himself or something in this. And let's look at uh, some ear controllers. Would be okay. I'm gonna do a little bit on the ears just to uh, hold our balance here. This isn't necessary stuff, but it's just stuff that helps add a little bit of character, a little bit of looseness to the uh, stiff, uh, stiffer head. And I think we'll probably tone it down a little bit and delay the tip of the ear by a frame or two. So that way it's not hitting at the same time. Like I said, let's grab the outer ear and delay it by considerably. one's a little uneven and probably a little too much so let's find a good balance place for it to be so not do too much down or too much up and I'm not going to be too concerned with uh, the polish on these guys it's just a little bit of movement there one's a little more than the other I'm just going to add a little bit of character okay so let's go ahead and save our file let's go ahead and turn our textures on Let's go ahead and watch this and see if there's anything else we want to tell on here, but I think we're probably pretty good for today. too much. Uh, we'll see. I think there's something we can do. Just something that wasn't really noticing that much before. But now that we've got the textures on, it feels like something we can play around with a little bit. And we'll delay our frame from here and do just a little amount, but it'll add that little bit of bounciness to the top of the head. Let's 
balance it out here. Just a little bit better and clean that up. And this might not leak exactly right just because of the wind and the timing that we're set up, but we can probably get something pretty close. Let's turn off our mid curves. Let's go ahead and play that. All right, now we're back. All right, so let's take a look back. We're looking at the beautiful work of Tom Lavelle, and he said, I consider myself a storyteller with a brush. I try to place myself back in imagined situations that would make interesting and appealing pictures. I'm intent on producing paintings that relate to the human experience. And I think that's um, a great way to approach uh, your next creative project is to try and imagine it before it's done and really get in there in your brain and really work through a lot of the things before you even get down to the piece of paper or before you sit in front of the microphone or before uh, you, know, you get in front of that piece of clay or whatever it is. You try and spend some time in your imagination when you get the time. Obviously, um, you know, sometimes we have to make a living and we don't have the uh, leisure, leisurely uh, ability to uh, really work through everything in our imagination, but if you can do that, usually tends to be the pieces that I know for myself tend to flow out of me a little bit better. And also try and keep uh, in mind the aspect of storytelling in anything that you uh, create. Uh, so that being said, I think that'll do it for today. I love you guys lots. If you're watching this, you are the creative future. I totally believe in you. Keep on uh, following your dreams and pushing yourself each and every day. And uh, remember, feel free to share anything down below. If you agree with some stuff that I did or you like something or you learned something, let me know. If you didn't, then let me know too. I'd, uh, I'd love to know what you disagree or you would have done different or your different approaches or anything. I'm, I'm a real big fan of kind of the methodology um, of creation and the, the environment of creation as much as the creation itself. So um, I think that'll do it for today. You guys are amazing. I love you lots and we'll see you for some more animation tomorrow.